Welcome, Eagles, to another episode of Tradcat Night Radio. I am Eric Kajewski, founder and owner of Tradcat Night, the most viewed and followed traditional Catholic apostolate worldwide. This is also home of the new crusade. And on this April 12th, uh, tonight's main topic will be Francis and Filet. But as always, my good friends, we have to take and have recourse to the Blessed Virgin Mary that she might guide this talk for the next hour or so, getting through uh, additional topics as we move along and get closer to the great chastisements foretold at Fatima, Portugal. And so, specifically, I would like to pray for those who are looking for greater clarity in their lives, discerning God's will, very tough times, confusing times. And so, for these, my heart goes out to uh, certainly have compassion for those uh, trying to figure things out uh, within this crisis, this modernist crisis of the church. And, um, again, as I mentioned we have to have recourse to the Blessed Virgin Mary and her rosary. Wear the scapular. Do those things that she asks. Um, partake in the first Friday and Saturdays. And you'll begin to see uh, those things which you hadn't seen before. And I can give testimony in my own life as to how this has happened. And so we pray in simplicity and humility. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. For those new, welcome to Trad Cat Night. Uh, as mentioned, this is the most viewed and followed traditional Catholic apostolate. We tried to cover a wide scope of topics. Um... What, we, what we're going to do going forward, as opposed to doing this on a weekly basis, these radio shows, I'm going to try to get these done every few days. And you'll see intermixed, intermingled, if you will, special guests coming on uh, throughout the upcoming months, which I hope you, you do enjoy. And so, uh, and it's going to cover a wide variety of topics again, whether it's from, uh, you know, traditional Catholic ap apologetics, whether it's on secret societies, on GMOs, uh, just on a wide variety of topics that you know we cover here at Trad Cat Night, which calls to mind uh, another uh, topic that's, uh, you know, I've been make, making notes these past few days, is concerning we need, we need more contributors. I'd like to have a more diversified um, panel of contributors uh, to Trad Cat Night, especially for those who are in the resistance, uh, I do have a few more who contacted me today. But you know, make sure you're, you're sending me uh, your latest information to Apostle of Mary at Hotmail dot com. Again, I read it all. I can't post it all, um, or, or main and post it in the main blog section. But certainly, I'll try to get it up at least, you know, into my Twitter feed. But nevertheless, that is uh, something. Uh, that we've been needing now for the past few weeks. I want to try to get uh, more of a diversification, if you will, uh, in that area. Again, check out the Trad Cat Night archive if you haven't already. Nearly 3,000 blogs now, wherein you could go in and uh, spend hours, spend days there. And it's very, very important for you to understand uh, the things that we have to say. What I'm finding on social media is people you know, contacting me and I don't, you know, I don't have a half hour, you know, at those particular mo moments and times to try to explain why we, you know, believe Benedict the 16th is the Pope, some of us in the resistance, you know, this, that's for you to go out and search on my social media channels uh, for you to do. Uh, so if you can't do that or you don't want to do that, that's not my problem. I, I just simply can't take my time out unless otherwise specified you contact me ahead of time and say, I'd like to talk to you for a half hour you know, a week from now or, or something like that, we can do that. Which goes to some comments I would like to uh, talk about right off the bat. I have to remind everyone, again, as we're growing, we're going to be under the gun. We're, we're going to be receiving, you know, more criticisms, more fire, probably, you know, the, the, the same old nonsense that you've been hearing online. Eric's a pornographer, Eric's a fraud, yada, yada, yada. It only helps us to grow in all honesty. So uh, please bear that in mind 
as more and more people are becoming aware of us. But I did have some comments that I wanted to get to today, which came on my YouTube channel. One particular individual had made a criticism uh, concerning, you know, the length of our shows. I think a lot of time people go on to other websites and they see these five, you know, 10, 15 minute segments and they think this is how we do things at Tradcat Night. No, these are Skype broadcasts. These are not, you know, five to 10 minute uh, little <laughs> segmented portions where they're scripted, uh, you know, oftentimes. Uh, so if that's what you're looking for, you're in the wrong place. Uh, you know, these radio shows, by all means, you know, by the time you get home, you could play it over the course of, you know, right after dinner, uh, you know, some more quiet time, and listen, listen in for that hour or so, much like you would with any other, you know, broadcast, whether it's a radio show or a Skype broadcast that you see online. Uh, and so I wanted to make that uh, very clear. This is not going to turn into some five or ten minute segment. And so that's what you have to realize when you're when you're clicking on uh, the particular topic that we're talking about today is Francis and Filet. Well, okay, you see that. Well, I'm not going to spend a whole hour talking about that. It's just the name of the episode for this particular Skype broadcast. Please keep that in mind because I had a couple uh, problems with some individuals today. I just banned because it was obvious that they were just trolling, probably from some of these pseudo-traditionalist sites, but uh, that's a side story. Uh <laughs> And then again, you know, some other commentary about, you know, try to stick to the more important subjects. Well, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, what we cover here, I feel, is important. Okay, we try to stress the interior life here. If this is not what you're all about, then this is not for you, and certainly you don't have what it takes to be an eagle. Okay, this is what we first stress, is the interior life. So we're going to spend a vast majority of time on a lot of these radio shows covering those topics. Um, and so I wanted to you know, make sure that individuals, uh, we, we kind of lay that down going forward. I'm going to shorten up these radio shows now. Many of you know we were doing two and a half, three hours for the weekly show, and that's because we have more information. Well, now doing them every few days, I'm going to get it down to about an hour or so. So we do have to get through, you know, some administrative functions here, uh, in the beginning. So once again, this is how we do things at Tradcat Night, not scripted. Uh, and we kind of take uh, different sections, if you will, and we move forward with them. Now, on tonight's show, I want to cover four main areas or four main topics and just kind of briefly talk uh, about them, at least for the first uh, three sections. And the fourth section is the, is the main topic concerning the recent comments made by Bishop Fillet that you know, Francis, you know, is calling us Catholic as if this is a good thing. And we've had to say this from day one, ever since that propaganda has come out out of the new SXPX, that this is not a good thing. And so if you want to know a clear division between a true traditionalist and a pseudo-traditionalist, go right to that point. Anyone who's parading around and think that's a good thing, they're on the wrong side of the fence, on the pseudo-trad side of the fence. And I'll get into uh, why that is. But first and foremost... You know, we have to talk about this latest apostolic exhortation briefly, and I just wanted to kind of skim the surface uh, because I want to go back and, and, and read it, read it a second time. Sometimes when you reread things, you see things you didn't see uh, the first time, much like when I was going through Vatican II the first few times, I caught some things, you know, on the third or fourth time. What I find uh, interesting is much like Vatican II, on the surface it seems like uh, much of this would be in conformity with tradition, but as you know, the the devil is in the details, so to speak. And so people have to pay attention to a lot of the footnotes, as some of uh, you know other uh, apologists have suggested. That would be my first and foremost comment within this section. What I find very interesting is that we had a prophecy. Um, and I'm trying to recall who actually even said it. I'm trying to get to it right now, and I apologize. Uh, but I covered this in a blog, um, I believe it was two days ago, concerning this new constitution for the family. That's what they're calling it. 
coming now out of uh, the Vatican, out of modernist Rome. And we have to remember what Saint uh, what uh, Saint Lucia said of Fatima: the final battle between the Lord and the reign of Saint will be about marriage and the family. But don't be afraid, because anyone who works for the sanctity of marriage and the family will be always be fought and opposed in every way, because this is the decisive issue. However, Our Lady has already crushed its head. Uh, so within this. Um, it was actually Sister Jeanne of the Nativity in the 1700s, where and she stated in a prophecy, One day I heard the new constitution will appear to many other than what it really is. It will bless it as a gift from heaven, whereas it is in fact sent from hell and is permitted by God in his just wrath. It will only be by its side effects that people will be led to recognize the dragon who wanted to destroy all, all and devour all. One night I saw a number of ecclesiastics. Their haughtiness and air of severity seemed to demand the respect of all. They forced the faithful to follow them, but God commanded me to oppose them, saying, They no longer have the right to speak my name, Jesus told me. It is against my wish that they carry out a mandate for which they are no longer worthy of. Now, this is a very interesting commentary. As many of you know, I've, I've kind of alluded to this prophecy to Vatican II, but now we see the Vatican saying very distinctly now, I believe this was in the La Observatore Romano, some official uh, publication for Rome, that they're, they're now calling it the New Constitution of the Family. Well, it's interesting because as we've been mentioning here all along, we have with the Vatican II new religion, or the Novus Ordo religion, we have the new humanism, the new human, uh, the new philosophy, the new humanism or integral humanism. We have the new theology. We have the new evangelization. We have the Church of the New Advent, new church, new new mass, the Novus Ordo Missa. Everything's new across the board, ladies and gentlemen. So here's another extension of that, and we could be uh, very well reminded by Pope St. Leo the Great, who says, The devil's always discovering something novel against the truth. Teach nothing new, but implant in the hearts of everyone those things which the fathers of venerable memory taught with a uniform preaching. Whence we preach nothing except from what we have received from our forefathers. In all things, therefore, both in the rule of faith and in the observance of discipline, let the pattern of antiquity be observed. And again, with this particular uh, piece, Amoris Letitia, we can see that it is indeed, once again, a break from tradition. It is revolutionary. Uh, and so, what should be a Catholic's response to this? Just like Vatican II as a whole, it gets scrapped. We don't sit there and we try to take, you know, pieces of it, if you will. We just, it's a an across the board saying, no thank you. This is what we have to do with the modernists. So if you're confused in these times, and I often tell this to people, uh, you know, what to do. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre tried to lay some, some ground rules for this in terms of what to, you know, what to do in this crisis is to keep things simple, which we'll, we'll talk about later, simplicity. You know, get yourself a pre-Vatican II catechism. Get yourself a, a, a Pius X catechism. You know, study the councils before Vatican II and just stay from it. If you, if you truly don't really know and understand and, and you know that you'll never be able to figure it out, it's the best piece of advice that I can give you because you're liable to suck up the poison and then start heading down the wrong path. And so it makes sense. Where there's poison, theological poison, we have to refrain from. There's no such thing as resistance from within, with the, which these pseudo-traditionalist groups try to make it seem uh, like it's a Catholic position. It, it just certainly is not. Can't find that. Um, so, that's very, very interesting that Sister Jean, uh, Jan of the Nativity said this. Now, specifically here, she said she saw a number of ecclesiastics. So it wasn't, you know, a, a small portion, but a, a good number of them, and she also speaks of a resistance. God commanded me to oppose them. That's what we have to do. We have to oppose these heretics. And it's and it's not going to get any better, ladies and gentlemen. There's rumors going around of Vatican III. Who, know, who knows when that will come up? And uh, I, I would say once you start 
hearing and seeing these rumors, forget about it. I mean, really start boarding up the doors, so to speak, and, and get ready for the worst of the worst, if you will. Now, we had a recent commentary by Cardinal Burke uh, today, kind of coming out and, and telling the other, you know, pseudo-trads, and I guess we would be labeled in this too, because we are calling it a revolution, um, you know, basically saying not to call it uh, a part of the revolution. And again, I had to respond to someone today off to the side uh, via email and say, you know, Cardinal Burke is still in the wrong. For all intents and purposes, he is a revolutionary. <laughs> the false right crowd, okay, is, is still very liberal. Okay, much like in our uh, political system, conservatives, uh, you know, and the liberals, Democrats, Republicans. It's really two sides of the same coin, controlled by the, the the same medium, if you will. Well, with the Cardinal Burks of the world, they they still accept Vatican II. They still don't see it as the new religion. They still don't reject the new mass. So they don't get a pass. They don't get a pass. So that's that's another indication, if you want to know, between a true traditionalist and a false traditionalist, a pseudo-traditionalist, is... is concerning these quote-unquote conservative cardinals like Cardinal Sarah, Cardinal Burke, Bishop Snyder. They're all part of the false right. So they need to repent, too, of Vatican II. Uh, I wanted to make mention of that because we're going to continue to call this a revolution uh, no matter what and use the platform that we have to do so. So as a whole, on the surface, can Catholics uh, accept uh, this latest nonsense coming from the Vatican coming from Francis, absolutely not, uh, much like Vatican II. And what I'm going to try to do is over the next week or so, and I'm actually hoping to do this with one of my special guests, is to break this down, uh, you know, specifically spend more time on it, probably give it an hour or so even, a whole show if I can't get that done with this specific guest that I have in mind over this next week. And uh, really cover it uh, in detail. And so that was the first piece I kind of wanted to just make brief mention of that I don't believe I've made a formal statement publicly on this via uh, the airwave, so to speak. Catholics cannot uh, accept it. Again, conscience, uh, this whole relative concept of conscience, which ties in with the New Age. Many of you know who follow this work. We see this developing eventually into the Christ consciousness, very much tying in with the New Age, uh, very much tying in with liberty of conscience, which is Freemasonic. And so <laughs> this is this is how these heretics think. <laughs> this is how these heretics think. And so we have to avoid it and keep exposing it. Now, two, uh, if I can get to... Uh, Father Ortiz. Now, within the resistance, many of you know there's just a lot going on. Uh, as I've mentioned before, as certain issues come up, I'll simply just make some commentary on it and let you know what I have to say on it. This is not one of these apostolates where I'm going to spend a whole half hour, you know, talking about Bishop Williamson's comments on the new mass or even about what's going on in Boston, Kentucky, with quote unquote Bishop Ambrose. Bishop uh, Moran, whatever, uh, you know, we'll say what we say, and then we kind of move along. In my, in my opinion, there's just a whole lot of other things to get to. But nevertheless, Father Ortiz invites all the resistance members to join in, in a campaign of prayers, and this was sent to me via email, and so I think there's some points here to consider for those who haven't seen this yet. On the blog we posted this afternoon, he says, There's too much talk in the resistance media and too little call to prayer. Now, I'll be honest with you, I've been one. <laughs> That's why I've been saying all along, we have to get back to the interior life. People are spending too much time on the computers getting involved in all the antics rather than uh, getting back to the basics, so to speak, the prayer life, the interior way. And that's why we spend so much time with this. Um, it's very, very important because it deals with your salvation. Our combat is, as St. Paul remarks, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the wor world of this darkness, against spirits of wickedness in high places. 
He states, I'm convinced that behind the worsening of the situation in the world, the aggravation of the crisis in the church, and the problems within the resistance, there is a renewed action of the devil sowing discord in the hearts and confusion in the minds. We cannot remain idle, so we must have recourse to every means given by God in these troubled times. Specifically, I would like to recommend to all our confreres and faithful, and he gives four well, three things uh, to consider and to do. He says to say daily, at least until Pentecost, a long exorcism of Leo the Thirteenth. The particular circumstances surrounding its composition and the obligation made by Leo the Thirteenth to say a shorter version after every Mass should convince us that God wants us to frequently to use frequently this powerful instrument against Satan and all the demons. This prayer is not restricted only to priests. When it's said by a layman, it should be done in private and not using the lines and the blessings reserved for the priest. It should be said with preference in Latin, but also is permitted in the vernacular. Two, to add to our daily rosary at the end of each decade, the shorter exorcism uh, of St. Michael. Three, to practice some fasting as our Lord recommends it, especially uh, against uh, the power of the devil because there are certain devils that can only go out by prayer and fasting mark nine twenty nine. and so this is uh you know rather brief but to the point simple for us to consider uh moving forward again i can only tell you that <clears throat> just what has transpired the last few months I- i've seen uh some individuals that i've tried to work with for my outside ministry see what's going on and they want nothing to do. <laughs> they want nothing to do with the resistance. And quite honestly, I can't blame them. I mean, certainly on a doctrinal level, do- doctrine is doctrine. But when they see antics uh, going on and the arrows being shot back and forth, and, and I'll just add very childish, uh, you know, behavior. I mean, at a certain point, you have to defend your name. I'm not suggesting that. Even I've done that with with uh, certain individuals in the resistance who have attacked me, and we have to go and uh, knock on their door, so to speak. And I just find that a good number of them happen to be cowards, and they they don't want to come out and talk and play, so to speak. But, uh, you know, the bottom line is, is with the consistent behavior uh, in this in this area and antics like that is certainly not going to win any souls, and it's certainly not going to help uh, sanctify your own soul and continue you uh, along the path to perfection, which every eagle is all about that's what we're about pursuit of perfection and so some good pointers there i wanted to point out so we've covered uh our first two points uh already here in the first uh 20 something minutes uh if i can really quickly before we get to the uh the sermon on simplicity which i'll get up into blog format tomorrow or at least i hope to I wanted to get to today's earthquakes because it was very striking to me. Uh, Again, as Planet X gets closer, we're going to see an increase um, in the veracity of these earthquakes, meaning in the magnitude. But then also the intervals will be smaller. So again, I pay attention to this on a daily basis. We're seeing this. We're seeing these birth pangs increase in intensity. And the intervals intervals are getting smaller, which means it's getting closer. It's getting closer, much like a woman is about to give birth. And again, the <clears throat> ultimate or climactic event uh, of the chastisements will be the three days of darkness, which will happen after civil unrest, martial law, economic collapse, World War III, etc., etc. So we can see that we are certainly uh, moving along quite readily. But today, specifically alone... For those earthquakes that were round about 5.0 or above, let's have a look. Micronesia, 4.7. Mid-Atlantic Ridge, 4.6. Micronesia, 4.6. Micronesia, 4.9. Micronesia, 5.1. South of Africa, 5.1. Micronesia, about a 5. Uh, West of Macri Island, I'm not even sure where that is, I'd have to look, 5.0. Japan, 4.8. Japan, 4.9. Mid-Atlantic Ridge again, 5.1. A few scattered earthquakes actually out in Oklahoma and Arizona, not quite at the 4, but still 
something to pay attention to. Tanzania, 5.2. Micronesia, 4.6. Micronesia, 5.4. Starting to see a trend here, the swarms. Nepal, 4.5. Iran, about a 4.5. Uh, interesting earthquake out in Tennessee today. I didn't see that the first time. Um, Indonesia, 4.7. Indonesia, 4.6. West of Mar Mercury Island, again, 5.2. Micronesia, 5.3. Chile, about a 4.5. Vanuatu Island, 5.2. Papua New Guinea, 5.2. Uh, Alaska, about a 4.5. Central East Pacific Rise, 5.4. Ladies and gentlemen, this is all in one day. <laughs> and you can see Micronesia just getting pounded today. Um, again, just pay attention to the swarms. Um, and I, I just wanted to call to mind, because I know we really don't have time to cover on these shows, uh, the earthquakes in general, but today it was just kind of startling today to see that trend uh, really increase uh, but nevertheless, I don't want to digress too much. As we move forward uh, today, talking uh, about simplicity, uh, which is very, very important in the spiritual life, of course. And what we're going to be covering was taken from a book called The Virtues, A Year with the Saints, written by a member of the Order of Mercy in the year 1891. Now, St. Vincent de Paul starts us off with this quote. He says, among those who make profession of following the maxims of Christ, simplicity ought to be held in great esteem. For among the wise of this world, there is nothing more contemptible or despicable than this. It is a virtue most worthy of love because it leads us straight to the kingdom of God. And at the same time, wins for us the affection of men since one who is regarded as upright, sincere, and an enemy of tricks and fraud is loved by all, even by those who only seek from morning till night to cheat and deceive others. And again, as I've been mentioning here in this apostolate, if you're not detached of heart from uh, those things of the world and you're not simplifying your life right now, you're going to find it very difficult in the days ahead on all levels, mentally uh, you know, spiritually, emotionally, and of course this will ultimately affect you physically. It will break you down. and God, That's what God wants to do ultimately, is to break souls down. To show them on that surface level what they are attached to. To show them the rotten hearts of modern man. Now, this saint, St. Vincent de Paul, himself truly had great esteem for simplicity and loved it much. Therefore, he not only kept himself from any transgression against it, but could not suffer those under his authority to commit any. If, at times, they were guilty of doing so, he would be sure to correct them for it through his great mildness. St. Francis de Sales also was full of respect and love for this virtue. As he once declared to a confidential friend in these words, I do not know what that poor vir virtue of prudence has done to me that I find so much difficulty in loving it. And if I love it, it is only from necessity in as much as it is the support and the guiding light of this life. But the beauty of simplicity completely fascinates me. It is true that the gospel recommends to us both the simplicity of the dove and the prudence of the serpent, but I would give a hundred serpents for one dove. I know that both are useful when they are united, but I think that it should be in proportion observed in compounding some medicines, in which a little poison is mixed with a quantity of wholesome drugs. Let the world then be angry, let the prudence of the world rage, and the flesh perish, for it is always better to be good and simple than to be uh, subtle and malicious." goes on to say, furthermore, simplicity is nothing but an act of charity, pure and simple, which has but one sole end, that of gaining the love of God. Our soul is then truly simple when we have no aim at all but this in all we do, right? All for the glory of God, uniting our hearts to the will of God and making life simple. If we're truly trying to just please God in all that we do, I guarantee you over time as grace begins to pour into your soul and you expand in selfless love that 
all things seem to just fade away. All those things you once cared about, you will find and see that it's truly nominal. It, it truly does not matter. And so, and so, my good friends, this is on every level, whether it's even our own health. Uh, that's what I learned, you know, this past few weeks. God was giving me kind of a refresher course in that on my bed of suffering, saying, you know, hey, buddy, listen, your body is not your own. It's mine. You know, when I tell you it's time I'm going to suffer in you, this is what's going to happen, and you're going to like it. <laughs> and at first, it be, you know, the self wants to rear its ugly head, but it becomes sweet over time. It truly does. And so, uh, you know, when we unite our wills and we, we rid ourself of the self, everything becomes sweet, even suffering. Now, we have St. Mary de P Piazzi once said, If I thought that by saying a word, however indifferent, for any other end than the love of God, I could become a seraph. I certainly would not say it. We have St. Vincent de Paul saying this, The office of simplicity is to make us go straight to God, without regard to human respect or our own interests. It leads us to tell things candidly, and just as they exist in our hearts. It leads us to act simply without admixture of hypocrisy and artifice. And finally, keeps us at a distance from every kind of deceit and double dealing. And again, with, with these particular vices, we're again dealing with that ugly head of the self, where there's self-interest and self-will. So again, we try to lay all our cards down, or I try to tell you, many of you know my story already. I'm very blunt and open about my story. Any of you who want to know further about that, you can contact me, and I try to be as open as possible. You're all going to see it at my judgment day anyways. <laughs> so, uh, you know, with my past life, you know, we, we can, you know, I can see the mistakes that I've made. Uh, we can go over that. We make the corrections much, much like, uh, you know, you know, a basketball team does. A, you know, a good coach sees the mistakes that the team is making, calls a timeout, corrects it. You put the plan in place, you go and you execute. Well, it's the same thing in the spiritual life. Now, we need grace, of course, to do this. We can't do this on a natural level alone. But this is what we're after. Perfection. Wherever you don't, wherever you leave off in this life is where you're going to pick up, pick up in the next. And it's very humbling to know that even at the heights of Christendom, the majority you know, spent their time in purgatory. And, uh, you know, so for us, we're given today, we're given these opportunities to better ourselves. And by better ourselves, I don't mean, again, on the natural level, I mean to unite our wills more closely to God. And so we truly could spend, you know, an, another hour or so on this uh, particular topic, but I want to give a few more quotes and then we'll have to leave it and move on for our main talk. St. Francis de Sales continues on. He says, God loves the simple and converses with them willingly and communicates to them the understanding of his truths because he, he disposes of these at his pleasure. He does not deal with the lofty and subtle spirits. True simplicity is like that of children who think, speak, and act candidly and without craftiness. They believe whatever is told to them. They have no care or thought for themselves, especially when, with their parents, they cling to them without going to seek their own satisfaction and consolations, which they take in good faith and enjoy with simplicity, without any curiosity about their causes and effects. Astuteness is nothing but a mass of artifices. Inventions, craft, and deceit by which we endeavor to mislead the minds of those with whom we are dealing and make them believe that we have no knowledge or sentiment as to the matter in question, except what we manifest by our own words. This is wholly contrary to simplicity, which requires our exterior to be perfectly in conformity with our interior. You know, how many people does God see, if you will, from from his vantage, who on the surface are truly not portraying what they are on the inside. I mean, take a look at the crooks behind the New World Order, really. Who walk around with their smiles, and all they do is they plan and they plot. They invent, they craft, 
and by deceit they deceive other people. These are not simple people. They do not have this virtue. Again, even from the theological side with the infiltration of the church, those who are devious, those who are behind this apostasy, they truly are not simple people. God will expose them. We'll, we'll see them personally on their judgment, and we will see personally who subjectively was destroying the church on purpose. And it's quite frightful to think about that day when you really think about it. Um, whom we thought may have been good, so to speak, wasn't really good. And maybe those who some have called out, uh, you know, to be on the wrong side of things, you know, maybe their intentions were truer. And it's going to be interesting to see. So we'll finish up in closing with this one particular area. This is the one area area or consideration I wanted you all to think about tonight with this talk is within this area of simplicity. You know, am I a simple person? And how can I become a more simpler person? You know, even for married individuals who are, you know, leading very hectic lives, you know, simplify things. It's good in anything you truly do, whether it's spiritual or otherwise. Simplicity, and also I would offer, you know, having structure. When a simple soul is to act, it considers only what is suitable to do or say, and then immediately begins the action without losing time in thinking what others will do or say about it. And after doing what seemed right, it dismisses the subject, or if perhaps any thought of what others may say or do should arise, it instantly cuts short such reflections, for it has no other aim than to please God, and not creatures, except as the love of God requires it. Therefore it cannot bear to be turned aside from its purpose of keeping close to God, and winning more and more of its of his love for itself. And so that's what we're after, the pursuit of God, who is perfection. Casting uh, aside the cares of this world, casting aside human respect, and just keeping after it. Just pu- just putting your, da- your head down, much like uh, an ox uh, in the fields, and just keep plowing away and plowing away. And I assure you, for those of you who are struggling still in the early stages of purification, the light will begin to slowly break into your soul, and suffering will become sweet. I can guarantee you that for those of you who right now are suffering terribly, that's just a little word for you. That light will break through if you continue to stay in a state of grace, refrain from mortal sin. You don't want to fall into this cycle of having, you know, a few good days or even a few good weeks and then, you know, have this notion of, well, I'll just give in to sin here and then we'll get back to being good with God. You don't want to tap dance with the devil like that. Just keep plowing ahead. Keep your heart on the straight and narrow, so to speak, do all things, do all things for His pleasure, and you will begin to see and understand from the from the interior through experience just how powerful holy suffering can be, and how it can truly transform your life if you allow God, um, if you allow God in in that sense. Now, a few hours ago, I posted my most recent blog that states the Pope, quote-unquote Pope, who is not Catholic, says, quote-unquote, who is Catholic. Now, we have a problem here with some of the recent comments by Bishop Filet. Again, making things out to seem positive, wherein Francis recently said, uh, and it was confirmed by Bishop Filet, that, you know, Francis said, we are Catholic. Well, this is not a good thing, ladies and gentlemen, because the problem is, is Francis is not Catholic. And yes, I can say that, pseudo-traditionalists. I don't need to be the magisterium to say that. You can hold theological opinions, much like St. Athanasius held his at his time, and his came to fruition. So it's very, very interesting to note, to me, this seems to be uh, a last tactic when we're generally speaking about modernist Rome in relation to the SSPX. From my point of view, it seems like they know the 
the Neo Society is not going to move any more than where they're at right now. So if they know that, they have to come up with a new angle or a new tactic. Now this is where most people don't understand. The next part of the New World Order plan, of course, is this false prophet character It's going to show up and unite all the quote-unquote Christian churches and humanity. It's not even going to be a real pope, which is concerning, uh, concerning to say the least. The point I'm trying to make is we're going to see, in my opinion, a modernist refugee crisis into the neo society now now granted there still are some individuals who are who are attending chapels who think like us who are, who are resistant minded who are attending chapels and they probably can give testimony to this by the way probably over the next you know let's say you know next few months or whatever people can get back to me on what they're seeing inside the chapels who who do feel they can still go there you can get back to me because i believe you're going to see now that francis has come out and said well, the the neo society is good. Okay. Well, people will probably now look at their maps and and get out and get to some of their near nearest uh, society chapels. Now, the problem is you're going to see a lot of people, <laughs> and this has had already been happening uh, when I was in in the society and, and heard other stories. You know, still people, you know, thinking Israel's the Zionist state of Israel. I can I can re recall several instances of that. But you're going to see all kinds of abominable errors and heresies now flood into these chapels, and people. It's going to confuse a whole lot of people. So there have been other apologists to suggest it w will be uh, a good thing. I think you can take that only to a certain point, but the far greater problem is going to be this this modernist refugee crisis. I'll call it. And it's really, it's really, there's going to be a flooding because now people think they can go there. Oh, they're Catholic and they probably won't even know all the, the positions of the society in all honesty, given how lazy, you know, modern man is. Uh, not all of them, but I would say a decent amount. And uh, this to me is a sign of desperation for modernist Rome because they know the enemy that's in there knows the next step. They know that this formal unification is coming, so they say, okay, well, they know they're not going to cave in, so we just have to accept them as is and then basically come up with a different angle to basically break them down and water them down. Now, I don't think they care so much about us and the resistance because we're not, we're not fooled by any of this, but sadly, the neo-society is. I mean, they can talk about all they want about how they know, you know, Zionism and Masonry and all this. But listen, if they really did understand what was going on and they did understand the New World Order plan, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing right now. And, and if they did, they would, it would only sh show, them, show it to be uh, even worse than what it is right now. I mean, I would say, how should I put this uh, charitably? Um, well, I guess we won't go there, but it's it's kind of like that person you see who keeps going back to the the girl that keeps cheating on the one person the guy keeps going back to them um that's basically what we're seeing with with uh filet and francis that situation they they keep going back and they just don't get it that, that's the most charitable word the, the neo society just don't get it that's not a theological term I'm just putting it in layman's terms they just they don't see clearly so does bishop filet and this is what i offered today Okay, as our main talk, does Bishop Flay understand the difference between the Universal Catholic Church and the new Universalist Vatican II Church? There is a difference. Now, we have to put aside our agreement that they are the authorities of the Church. We, we both agree that. We're not saying of a consensus and say, you know, they're invalid, you know, Francis is invalid, he's not even a priest. We don't take that angle. We have to cast that aside. We both recognize that they are the authoritative figures. Now, what's the problem? Well, they're not teaching the Catholic faith. <laughs> they're teaching the Novus Ordo faith, the, modern, the new modernist faith. And on the basis of that, you have to keep your distance. That's church teaching. That's not my opinion. And again, we have church precedents laid down with the, you know, the St. Athanasius and the Arian crisis. So there's a difference between what is you know, what we tr traditionally understand as Catholic, and the Catholic which is coming out of the Vatican's mouth today. When they say Catholic, it doesn't mean Catholic. It's their modernist interpretation of Catholic, or new Catholic. 
the Novus Ordo Catholic. And it was Blessed Anne Emmerich who talked about that. She saw people were divided into two camps. I think everyone can see that. The traditionalists and the modernists. Traditionalists are your Catholics. The modernists are not Catholics. And unfortunately, the majority are in that modernist camp, following along in false obedience, like lemmings. And or are simply confused and trying to figure things out. So time and time again, Bishop Fillet demonstrates that he, he simply can't tell the difference. As much as he says, you know, he, he knows, you know, Freemasonry is involved, Zionism to some degree is involved, yada, yada. It's clear in his actions, he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't get it. He says he's against the errors in the council, and yet the universalists since Vatican II, who stood behind those errors and heresies of Vatican II, now simply take it uh, to the next level by accepting the society as is. So that's that's not a good thing, because in theory, they should be acceptance of uh, they should accept uh, the neo society. But why? Because they are universalists, ladies and gentlemen. They, they, in principle, accept all. However, we, kn we know universalists not to be Catholics. And again, for those who are not affluent with Judeo-Freemasonry, universalism comes from this sect. It's a key component. That's why you see, uh, since Vatican II, this whole notion, you know, Jews and Muslims worship the same true God. It's the, it's the one world religion forming. Um, again, liberty, conscience comes into play. Everyone has a right to their own opinion, a public right to their own opinion, which is complete nonsense. It's been condemned by the ordinary infallible magisterium. We can't go along with it. So here, in this particular case, Francis is no different. Now I could sit here and label him with a dozen other names which are not Catholic, and all of which are not good. I'm not going to do that. I'll, I'll spare you that. We, we've mentioned this before in the past. Uh, and there's a cute little picture that someone had actually sent to me where in October uh, 2013, uh, Francis came out and said, I believe in God, not a Catholic God. There is no Catholic God. And again, this stems from his, his Masonism, his universalism. And so there's, you know, God looking down upon him and saying, there is no Catholic Pope. Um, so, you know, let's put aside the argument from uh, my perspective that Francis is not even the true pope to begin with. And we'll, we'll play devil's advocate and we'll go along and say that, you know, Francis uh, is the true pope. Uh, we, we still see this delusion on the part of Bishop Flay and these other blind leaders in the society. I know there was Father, I think it was Father Wagner who who's come out publicly and said, you know, we can't say, you know, R Rome is uh, Antichrist, which is complete baloney when we take a look at it and see even what, um, Our Lady of La Salette had said, you know, make no mistake, these modernists are forerunners to the Antichrist personally. They are Antichrist, as Archbishop Lefebvre said. So again, even this particular case, this poor blind uh, priest in the Neo Society goes against what Archbishop Lefebvre said. He knew he knew how snaky they were. He knew they were trying to cut all kinds of angles and tried to get them into the conciliar church so they could break them down. Um, but Bishop Filet doesn't get that. And if he does, he's just being really idiotic in the sense that he's allowing to lead people into that type of situation. That's not prudent at all. Um, so we are in that apostasy, ladies and gentlemen. We mentioned this over and over again. Scripture and tradition has warned us. The esteemed theologians have warned us. Uh, Thess you know, I think it's 1 Thessalonians 2, 14, I believe, talking about uh, the great apostasy, the great revolt, which is what Vatican II was. Um, so Francis, ladies and gentlemen, is a modernist, a universalist. He's he's not a Catholic. Okay, and just because it hasn't been deemed yet doesn't mean in the future that it won't be deemed that, much like Pope Honeer's wasn't deemed to be anathematized till his third successor at the, the Third Council of Constantinople. It's going to happen in the future after the chastisements. Uh, the Vatican II popes will get their just desserts, so to speak. So from our perspective in the resistance, if Francis doesn't even have an understanding of what the, what the proper understanding of what tradition is, how can he even have uh, an inkling as to who a Catholic is? I mean, we know from our Catholic faith that Scripture and tradition compose the Word of God. If you if you rupture from tradition, then you cease to be Catholic. That was Saint Athanasius, by the way. 
you no longer should even be called Christian, by the way. So I would use that in the case of Francis. I mean, we shouldn't even call him a Christian. He's not. What he teaches is a different faith. Universalism, Masonism, Gnosticism, a whole lot of isms, socialism. It's not Catholicism he stands behind. So how does Bishop Fillet publicly come out and have the audacity to accept this label from him? You know, as if this is a good thing. You know, the Pope said we're, we're Catholic. Uh, no refutation there. No, um, well, we don't, you know, we don't accept this label. We humbly don't accept this label. I mean, we're still waiting for Rome's conversion um, because these universalists, again, are not Catholic. Francis calling anyone a Catholic is like a dog calling a cat a dog. <laughs> Yet we have two different things going on here, two different religions in play. The Novus Ordo religion, which is being passed off as Catholic. And by the way, Archbishop Lefebvre said this. You know, he, he said it, you know, I'm paraphrasing, of course, he, he basically said we don't accept the whole notion of modernist Rome interpretation, you know, of Catholic. It's because it's, it's not Catholic. We have Yves Marsardon, a 33rd degree Scottish right Freemason. This was in the, oh gosh, somewhere in the 60s. You know, he came out openly and praised the revolution of John the 23rd. He said the sense of universalism that is rampant in Rome these days is very close to the purpose of our existence. So, you know, with John the 23rd, he was laying down the tracks for the new religion. And universalism at that time, point was still prevalent uh, and that's why I put that in there because I wanted everyone to understand so it, you know the problem is not just Francis I mean goodness it stems from the council itself which has universalist texts in it uh, the one that I keep harping on it's a major heresy is the one where it states the, ch uh, the church is a sign uh, a symbol of the unity of the whole human family that's blatant masonism and universalism it's heresy written right into the text uh, of Vatican II. So we have to remember that according to these texts, you know, all, all humanity is to be considered as in the church. So of course Francis should say to Filet that they are Catholics. It's only common sense from their point of view, meaning from the universalist point of view, because they consider all to be in the church uh, anyways, the, the church that they're creating, this, this Vatican II ecumenical universalist church. Yet, any real Catholic who fundamentally understands the difference between universalism and Catholicism should outright protest and ask that Francis and Rome convert before accepting such a label publicly and standing behind it. Yet again, Bishop Flay doesn't do it. It only goes to show me he doesn't get this. He just doesn't get it. That's going to be my new theological term. Just don't get it. <laughs> um, so... You know, if you see people celebrating out there, I have saw a lot of pseudo traditionalists. Yeah, this is great. You know, we're now called Catholics uh, by these heretics, and so the whole pseudo trad uh, rejoices. But again, we have to remember now we shouldn't be so joyous because uh, Catholic these days ain't your grandma's Catholic anymore. Catholic these days is universalist. Uh, therefore, we have problem. In Vatican II, New Church, all have a right to an opinion. Liberty of conscience. Uh, it's the basis of masonry, religious liberty and liberty of conscience. And so this is the new heterodox Church of Rome, the new universalist church that Blessed Anne Emmerich was warning us about, which will soon end in the formal unification of all religions for those new who are listening in for the first time, by the way. This is your harlot in Revelation. I think it's Revelation 17. The Vatican has been merely giving an illusion that the SSPX was not inside this conciliar church from their perspective because they want everyone to buy into their program. That's why. Even though the texts themselves say that all, all humanity is included in this church, uh, you know, they only give the illusion on the surface level for those who don't really study the text because they want everyone to accept Vatican II. Uh... So, you know, do we want to be a part of this <laughs> this new church? <laughs> Absolutely not. And neither did uh, Archbishop Lefebvre, but Bishop Fillet does. You know, he basically takes the argument, there are, you know, the, uh, the the lawful authorities, therefore basically we can be under them. And again, that there's no position, there's no such teaching 
uh, in Catholic, uh, you know, Catholicism or any such church precedents where we can do as such when we're, when we're dealing with heresy. Because heresy always implies a, se a, a separation from. And simply because they haven't been proven to be a heretic yet is not a license to say we can be in it. That's not that's what they tr that's what the pseudo traditionalists try to pass off and get you to believe is prudence when it is not. It is not prudence. I mean, if you can see a building on fire, I don't I don't need to have the firemen pull up, uh, you know, five minutes later and tell me, you know, son, you got a fire in there. Well, duh, I see the fire. You see the fire, you avoid the fire, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so we don't need to be the formal authorities to declare that. If, again, we can solidly prove that uh, theologically from tradition, which we do. Just some people don't want to accept it. They'll keep tap dancing and, and so on and so forth. So uh, Bishop Fillet holds uh, to this thesis that there are novelties in Vatican II and, can be, and, and still can be accepted by these modernists and be called Catholic. Uh, but again, these modernists are not Catholic and they do not have the proper notion, again, of... of what the church is, who is even in the church, and just the faith in general. And then also to add uh, the gospel in general. What's their gospel? Well, the impotent humanitarianism, the social gospel, the, the naturalist gospel. That's Vatican II gospel. That's Francis's gospel. That's not our Lord Jesus Christ's gospel. On the basis of that, they are anathema. They are to be avoided after first and second Admonish, uh, after admonishing them in scripture we are to avoid we've been telling them for quite some time now they're not Catholic, your gospel's not ours we have to keep from them, avoid that's scripture, not to integrate there's nowhere in integrate there, there's nowhere in scripture or from church teaching or from church precedence that says well, there's a contagion or a heresy yep, you can stay in the fire so to speak that's the pseudo trad position, ladies and gentlemen. You're being deceived if you're in that in one of those groups, the Rorarte, the Remnants, the New SXPX. There's there's no such position, and so, ladies and gentlemen, we haven't left the church. We are essentially what is left of the church. Not that we are the church or the resistance is the church. Essentially, we are what's left of the church due to uh, Vatican II modernism. So the gates of hell haven't prevailed. Jesus Christ will have his victory. He will socially reign. Our Lady will, the, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart will soon commence. And uh, so we're, we're not at all concerned about that. Um, you know, so this is frightening to us, ladies and gentlemen, that so many people can't see this. Uh, and so I just made a commentary today that sadly, it's not going to surprise me now at this point if Bishop Fillet, quote unquote, recognizes this soon false prophet to arise in Rome after Anti Pope Francis steps down and, and literally, like, takes orders from him, says, well, you're the visible church. <laughs> You know, using some argument like that. I mean, goodness gracious. Um, you know, he's as blind as a bat, unfortunately. And I say that with all charity. That's just the reality of the situation. This has been going on for many years now. Actually, a decade, if not longer, of his wishy-washiness. So we should all, in the end, my friends, take lessons from St. Saint Saint Athanasius and Archbishop Lefebvre, not Bishop Fillet. The ultimate question is not... If Francis would consider me or anyone else Catholic, right? No, the ultimate question is if Francis is first Catholic himself. And the answer is no. Those who say otherwise fail. They fail to see this. You can't help the blind. Only grace can do that. We can only point this out, continue to educate as best we can. Those who want to try to simply disagree or argue, pfft, goodbye. We don't want to deal with you in that sense, meaning I'm not going to sit there and, and waste a half hour and try to debate with you. Bishop Fillet is failing the church, ladies and gentlemen. So in summary, Vatican II universalism, and it's truly started with the council, and again, we could show other texts, and I know Father Hess has pointed this out in his talks. And by the way, just it continues on. John the 23rd, I mean, goodness. Uh, John Paul II is an egregious universalist. I have a, a blog on him. And it just goes on and on. I don't want to just point out that it's Francis. It's not. It's just a continuation of the Vatican II new program. Uh, so Vatican II ecumenism and universalism truly do go hand in hand, and they both stem from the Freemasonic sect. I would also add a further point uh, that this modernist mercy right, is a tool used 
by the universalist to to graft everyone to graft everyone more in so to speak it's kind of like a garden tool that just shovels more more dirt into the garden and so they're trying you know these these modernists are trying to use this whole mercy concept to get more and more under the branch of this ever budding new church uh which we know as catholics we can't do um so francis is not catholic ladies and gentlemen but a universalist and these universalists embrace all Catholics in return cannot embrace these universalists. And this is exactly what Bishop Fillet is doing in this acceptance, recognition, however you want to say, that this is such a great thing that Francis has called me Catholic. No, it isn't. It's frightening that Bishop Fillet truly does accept that and kind of show you where his mindset is at. Um, So we had Archbishop Lefebvre in closing, ladies and gentlemen, if I can. Uh, said this concerning the whole argument of the visible church argument that the pseudo pseudo trads like to use. He says, to stay inside the church or to put oneself inside the church, what does that mean? Firstly, what church are we talking about? If you mean the conciliar church, then we who have struggled against the council for 20 years because we want the Catholic church, we would have to re-enter this conciliar church in order supposedly to make it Catholic. That is a complete illusion. Ladies and gentlemen, Archbishop Lefebvre completely in this sentence refutes Bishop Fillet. That we would have to re-enter this conciliar church in order to supposedly make it Catholic. Again, Catholic in the concept we understand it as real Catholic. He says this is an illusion. It's not the subjects that make the superiors, but the superiors who make the subjects. That's common sense. This talk about the visible church uh, on the part of Dom Gerard and Mr. Madrian is childish. It is incredible that anyone can talk of the visible church, meaning the conciliar church as opposed to the Catholic church, which we are trying to represent and continue. Uh, I'm not saying that we are the Catholic church. I've never said so. No one can reproach me with ever having wished to set myself up as a pope. But we truly represent the Catholic church such as it uh, always has been before because we are continuing what it always did. It is we who have the notes of the visible church. One, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. That is what makes the visible church, ladies and gentlemen. So don't be deceived by a lot of these pseudo-trads you know, who, who say, well, why aren't you in the diocese? Why aren't you at the FSSP Mass or the Institute of Christ the King Mass? And you have to tell them because, A, Vatican II is a rupture from tradition. It is universalist. It is a new religion, a novus ordo religion that has a new everything, a new evangelization, a new mass, a new theology, a new humanistic uh, philosophy. And all of these things have been condemned, many of which infallibly condemned. And so the Catholic Church teaches we have to keep our distance. So this is not a schism. Uh, again, in a loose sense, the conciliar church is schismatic in a silent schism which will become formal, by the way, here soon. So that leads us into a whole other discussion of, you know, how the church gets itself uh, back on its feet, because we are about to have conversions take place through these massive chastisements. There are going to be conservatives to wake up. Benedict XVI willfully with some conservatives. Uh, we don't want to get into that. I just wanted to lay some some boundaries here in this talk for, you know, as to why we can't accept these recent comments of uh, Bishop Fillet concerning you know, Francis and these modernists, or anyone else for that matter, whether it's Schoenborn or whoever else, some of these other apostates. Uh, that's what we have to do, ladies and gentlemen. We have to keep resisting for the sake of their conversion, for the sake of them seeing clearly. You see, even by this, Bishop Filet is not doing Francis any good because there's no uh, promulgation to conversion for Francis now in that acceptance. Oh, that's great. You see us as Catholic? Okay, well, you teach something completely different, different principles and tenets, and yet you're you're saying that we are Catholic and we can hold <laughs> to our position. I mean, it really doesn't make sense on a whole lot of levels. And again, with me, listen, I don't claim, you know, to be the smartest man in the world. I do have uh, an advanced degree. I do c- claim to be able to think and have some common sense, and I just don't see that with Bishop. Fl- I truly don't. As good as an intent he's, as he may be, to me. Uh, let's just say if I were a hiring manager, I would have to bypass. I mean, just it's not there, ladies and gentlemen, for me. And it's and since we're dealing with uh, souls, salvation, this is why we have to be so 
blunt and lay that down uh, in terms of, of, of a line in the sand there. And for us, the red lighters, so to speak, and the resistance, we would simply tell you to stay away from the Neo Society uh, altogether. Not that there, you might find fragments, if you will, of, of priests who will say the same thing. You know, that you have to decide for yourself and for your own families. You make your own decisions. We, you know, I can only speak from uh, my perspective and in the general sense. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to be it for tonight. Again, I told you we're going to try to shorten up these talks so that you can get through all of these talks in basically an evening, about an hour or so. And again, same thing with the special guests. I would say with the exception of a few I have coming up, I know I'll have one Planet X expert coming up here um, in the next few weeks. That's not going to be an hour-long talk. That's probably going to be closer to three hours. So please hang tight. I hope that you all continue to pray the rosary, stay close to Our Lady, and in simplicity, um, no one understand, you know, how important it is to, how should I say this, you know, how important it is for us to speak about these things open and publicly. It's, it's not easy, you know, all the time, and we have to point these things out, and I, I could just, you know, see the anguish on, on the face of Our Lady. I mean, we, we have to speak out on these things. Again, we hold nothing subjectively against uh, certain people, but it just comes to a certain point where you have to draw a line in the sand and say, okay, enough, enough, I have to break. I have to break from that position and or people holding that position and continue to call that out. So why we can't be a part of that. So again, it's all done in charity. It's all done knowing in the end that the Immaculate Heart will triumph. And I hope that you keep uh, me in prayer. And so let us pray uh, together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And until next time, my good friends, Ave Maria.